I will tell you that I know that DFW, I know that right here in Grand Prairie, and I know all over these United States and around the world, there are lots of people that bow down to idols. And today I want to talk to you about that subject because I do know that this is an epic problem in our nation. Uh, it truly is. And sad to say, it's even a problem for people that are not just people uh, outside of church, but it's for a problem for people inside the church. Uh, the Lord said something very strong in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says that we can't drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devil, that you'll end up serving the devil by trying to keep a foot in the church and a foot in the world. So I want to share something with you that I think is highly, highly important for your hearing today. We're kind of like that little boy uh, that, you know, you're trying to get your way and he was wanting a, a bicycle. And uh, this little boy asked his mom, she said, can, you know, can I get a bicycle either for my birthday, which was coming up or a little bit further away Christmas. And she said to him, you should pray about it. Well, he decided that he should take his mom up on that. She's smart. She gives him good advice. So he goes to his bedroom and he decides he's going to write Jesus a letter and that he would pray this prayer every night. Well, he writes the letter and he says, Dear Jesus, I have been a really, really perfect boy. I would like a bicycle either for my birthday or Christmas and then signed it his name. Thank you. And he knew she told him to say in Jesus name. So he wrote in Jesus name and signed his name. He looked at that note and he realized that that note was not honest. It was going, not going to be an honest prayer because he's not a perfect boy. So he rewrote it and said, dear Jesus, I uh, am a good boy most of the time. And then he signed it in Jesus name. I'd like to have this bicycle. As soon as he finished, he's like, that's not even true either. So he wrote it again. He said, Jesus, I want to be a good boy. And I do want this bicycle for my birthday or for Christmas. And thank you very much in Jesus' name. He looked at that. And he said, you know, I don't even want to be a good boy. I got a problem. So he went downstairs and he found the statue that they had of Mary in the living room. And he took a towel and he wrapped up the statue of Mary. He took it up and put it under his bed. And then he wrote this note. Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> There you go. I'll tell you, man, we got idols, don't we? We got idols. Well, that was a little I idol statue, right? And, of course, obviously the, the Catholics are a little more given to the statues than, than we are. We're not uh, given to that much in uh, our, our vein of walking in the faith in Christianity. I want to share with you that in this passage, we're going to come to this scripture there's lots more statues around, lots more idols than just Mary sitting around. I want to share with you that in this passage, we have this, the longest uh, commandment of all of them. The Sabbath is almost as long, but this one is the longest. Uh, it is 94 words in the NIV. It's the longest, as I said, of all of them just a tad shorter than the Sabbath. John Bassanio, uh, pastor at uh, uh, Second uh, First Baptist Houston for, for many years, he wrote this in his little, wrote a tremendous book on the Ten Commandments. In fact, I'm going to quote him a couple of times today out of that great read. He says, the second command is made obvious by the first. The second command is made obvious by the first. Once a man has settled the question, what God shall I serve? The next question is, what is this God like? God, however, he doesn't represent himself that way. Bassanio went on to write in his book, 
on the Ten Commandments, he says, settle for nothing less than God himself. To settle for the image rather than the essence, the idol rather than the object, the picture rather than the reality is to absolutely miss God's best. You're just going to miss God's best. If you settle for an image and not the creator, God himself. I want you to look at a couple of things today, and I want to build this on this first point, and that is this. God has exclusive rights to you. Everybody in here surely can amen that, that God has exclusive rights to you. Doesn't he? Doesn't he have rights? Didn't he create you? Sure did, didn't he? I want you to see why that's the case. You see, the priority of putting God first, and we'll be looking at that commandment next week, they are, it is connected to the second commandment. And I want to explain this just a little bit as we uh, touch on this today. This issue really does evolve around the principle where the first two commandments have to be taken together. Let me share with you what I'm talking about. The first says that we will have no other gods before me. That's what Yahweh God, Jehovah God told us, don't have any other gods before me. Part of that practice is not having any idols. And we know that God made us. He created us. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, one of my favorite chapters in all the, the Bible, definitely one of my favorite in Isaiah, it says these words, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for what? My glory. God didn't make you for just you living your life. He made you for his glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah 43, verse 7. The practice of putting God first. Here's where the two commandments are intertwined. Watch this. The passage tells us that the practice of putting God first, it's as simple as you've got to look at commandment number two. It's not a repeat of commandment number one, is it? It is different. It is distinct. Putting God first, you shall not make for yourself any idol. The way I put God first in my life, soon as he tells me I shall have no other gods before him, then he tells me that I will not, I, I will not make any graven image. And we're going to talk about that now. Now, he tells us in verse 4, <clears throat> you shall not make for yourself an idol. An idol. Idols are funny things. I remember when I was um, staying at a family member's house, and they had a statue of Buddha, and it was the prosperous Buddha. He was, he was round, and uh, they had used him as a little thing on the on a uh, uh, one of the you know like a chest of drawer. Uh, it was on top of that. And then we come back sometimes, and it was a door stopper. <laughs> and we'd come back. Well, it about drove me crazy that I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, and Buddha's sitting there staring at me in the room. You're like, well, it's just, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an object. Well, Buddha had several accidents while we were visiting there where he fell off in the floor, chipped part of himself off, uh, I never suffered any consequences for this, I can tell you, because that's been many, many years ago. I was young married. Anyway, Buddha got chipped, and I apologized to the people, and I was offended that they even had it in the house. But anyway, I was just a young, idealistic Christian and, and uh, pastor, and I, uh, uh, that thing just deeply disturbed me. And I was always put in the bedroom where that Buddha was. And even one time we moved and Buddha moved and came to the other room. I'm like, they're messing with me. Well, Buddha had a really bad accident and several pieces broke off of him that time. Yeah, I don't know what happened to him. That's a lie. I shouldn't preach and lie, should I? I know exactly what happened to him. I was guilty. But... Buddha never struck out against me. He never did anything to me. You know why? Because these idols are just that. If you go to this incredible psalm, 
where it's speaking about they have mouths, but they don't speak. They've got arms, but they can't do anything with those arms. They've got legs, but can't stand. That they are just an idol, and they can't do anything. Not like the living God. And it's important. I won't talk about Buddha anymore. But anyway, Buddha finally disappeared, or at least when I was there. That was exactly what I was after. <laughs> Look at what the scripture tells us. The Bible says God is jealous for our affection and worship. This is part of what he's speaking to of being that there is this affection for us and he wants us to worship him. And in Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, look at what it says as we read a little deeper into the passage. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God. Now Oprah Winfrey was attending a Baptist church in Chicago and had professed Christ since she was young but she was going to the same church where Obama was going. That's kind of not good news right there because this pastor is really liberal. But he was saying as he was preaching that day, and she said she's amen and right with him. And he said, God is uh, an all-present God. God is an all-powerful God. And then he said, God is a jealous God. And Ophrah said that from that day forward, she didn't want to worship a God that is jealous. Well, have you ever experienced jealousy in your marriage relationship? Other relationships where you're jealous of time spent not with you? You ever been there? Sure you have. It is a natural response in a love relationship, isn't it? You're full of affection for them. You want that affection to be coming back to you, right? Well, Ofer said she never could get past that. And she left Christianity over a pastor saying something very biblical that God is a jealous God. He doesn't want you chasing after other gods. That's what this issue is getting to. He doesn't want you chasing after idols. He wants you to be pure of heart and that you're focused on the love that he has extended to you, that you give it back to him. Well, she left the faith over that. To this day, she condemns Christianity and the Bible for saying God is a jealous God. She said, I, I just couldn't agree with that anymore. Well, that's called being an apostate. Plain and simple. You appear to be in the faith, and then you walk away from it. And that's what that is. So I'm at, I know she does lots of kind things for people, and I know she gives millions away, and she's even had her show where she gave, back in the day, where she gave cars to everybody that was in the, in the audience. I wish I was there that day, don't you? But man, did she flub it up when she realizes that she doesn't believe that God is a jealous God. The Bible says so. See, we don't have to always understand everything that we read in the Scripture. You just have to affirm it's there and it's the truth. And that's what you have to sit down on. Look at this. And we can play pretend all we want, but God tells us that he is jealous for our affection and our worship. You know, uh, boy, I'm telling you, I, I, I think if, you know, I had a picture of another woman instead of my wife, we've been married 42, I, I know she wouldn't say, well, Barry's, you know, he's, he deserves his privacy. <laughs> I, I fear God and I fear her second in that order. I know I'm supposed to just fear God. But I, I, I know she wouldn't say that. I'd first, I'd get knocked out of the bed, 
And then who knows what would happen after that. But it wouldn't be any respecting my privacy. You know what I'm talking about, and I'm a one-woman man. I don't have another picture of another woman in my, in my phone or billfold. Just, just saying, don't tell her something different, all right? I want to have a good afternoon. As previously stated, God is jealous for our affection and worship. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them, worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is the spirit of the second commandment. Ron Mel wrote a book called The Tender, Ten, and then in parentheses, Der, Commandments. And he talked about how <clears throat> it's all about love. <clears throat> and in his book, he wrote this. I am your God. I'm your redeemer. I have saved you and bought you for myself at a terrible price. Please don't ever put anything in the place that belongs to me. This is a good explanation of that jealousy that God has for us. I love you with all my heart, and I have always wanted to care for you, protect you, provide for you, and bless you. Now, because I love you more than anything, any, any other, let me ask you for something very important to me. I'm asking that you have no other gods in your life, that I would be your one and only. And didn't that happen in a marriage relationship when you said that we will pledge to be married to each other and it's just you're my one and only? And if you've had a stumble along the way and you've gone through a marriage breakup, then, you know, there's times that God gives grace in a second go around where you found someone that may even be more like a soulmate. You may be asking, what is an idol? Well, idol comes from the Hebrew word pestle. And pestle means carved wood or stone. So it's just talking about the physicality of, a, of an idol, that it's usually made out of carved wood or stone. It also can come from pastel, which means to carve. And later in this very book of Exodus, chapter 34, chapter, chapter 34, verse 17, there is there the statement about cast idols out of metals, melted metals. And in that passage, it is forbidden as well. It goes on to say in that passage that you shouldn't make things that are images of the sun, the moon, the stars, or on the earth, animals, or in the water below, fish, crocodile, other sea life were forbidden by God. Why? Because he is a jealous God. He doesn't want anything to rival his affection and his worship that he gives to you. It's an a, a absence of such dedication for us is the way it should be. Ron Mel in his book, The Tender Commandments, talking about you can't do them unless you love the Lord. That's why he calls them the Tender Commandments. He wrote this, and I think it's the best definition I've ever heard of idol or read in a book. I just think it's, it's, it's the one that stuck out to me all these years as I've studied and studied, and I've come to this is just like the best one. He says, idols are anything, and it's that general, isn't it? Idols are anything that take our focus off of God. That's an idol. It could be a job. It could be a house. It could be, uh, it could be friendships. It could even be another person. You got to watch that even about a spouse. You don't put them in the place of God. They're below that, aren't they? He goes on to tell us, and we know there's all kinds of idols today. There's power. There's pleasure, fame, status. All these things are idle, and uh, we need to make sure that we give our talents, our treasures, our energy to the Most High God. Amen? We don't need to be giving it to other things. Archaeologists have discovered, as they have studied and continue to study, that in every culture they find, they find that there is a history of idols, statues of little gods and goddesses, people that they have uh, worshipped that were part of their culture, uh, 
Man just for some reason has this desire to have objects that uh, are a representation of that very thing. Now, in the biblical time that we're looking at, there's basically three major idols that were common in that day. One was Baal, and you'll see Baal in the scriptures in the Old Testament. Baal will be attached to multiple different names. Baal Peor, you'll see Baal uh, in many forms, but it was the female counterpart of Ashtara who was the god of sex in that Old Testament setting. There was also Mammon, which is the God. Jesus even makes a reference in the King James. They translate it that way. Uh, in, even in the, uh, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. But Mammon was the God of money, of materialism, wasn't it? Uh, and then there was Molech. Molech was the God of violence. Now I want you to hear what we just talked about. Sex, money, and violence. That sounds like Hollywood, doesn't it? <laughs> Seriously. Doesn't that sound like entertainment today? It sure does, doesn't it? We're, these gods are still around. These idols are still here. Why? Because they seduce men and women to this day. We are seduced by these things. They're there. Second of all, I want you to look at something, and this is going to be the other main point that I bring today, and I knew I, I could only do these two. God warns that worthless pursuits result in worthless ends. You need to realize that about idols. They can't do anything for you. Even if it's worship of the demonic, there's little power compared to the power of God. So in verse 5, chapter 20, Exodus it says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation of those they hate. Now, there's something really interesting here that has just been said. He tells us that those that choose not to worship the Lord God, those that will choose wickedness over following God, he tells us that God will literally, there's a principle here of cursing and blessing. Now, here's the thing. This is getting ready to speak to us about generational curses. You can't read the Bible seriously and not come to the reality that there are generational curses. All you have to do is look at our culture, our society, and you'll see that there are sins that are revisited upon different generational factors out here in our culture that they happen over and over and over again. They are literally generational curses. They are. And I want to share with you what is being said here. Uh, it, he tells us that these sins of the fathers will be visited to the third and what? Fourth generation of those who hate me. I want you to see something. If you go to the scriptures found in the book of Psalm 135, often it's kind of odd. We tend to look like our idols. It's because they're, there's what, it's what's important to us. He says in Psalm 135, verse 15, the idols of the nations are silver and gold made by the hands of who? Of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Kind of interesting passage, isn't it? Listen to this one out of the book of Jeremiah. Same thing. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Following idols, not following the living God, equates to worthlessness in your life. You're going to live a worthless existence. That's what it is driving home. So here's the bad news. The bad news is in verse 5. Punishing the children for the sins of the fathers 
to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. I want you to hear something. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, I'm going to use about four or five different translations because I want you to really hear this. And I think there's a few translations that really brought some good light to this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children is quite literal in this Hebrew language. The iniquity of our fathers is literally the evil activity of our fathers. And before you ladies think you're dismissed, I want to read to you a couple other translations because it's all of us. So he says <clears throat> to us that we shall not make any graven image. We shouldn't worship any other gods. Visiting the iniquity is literally attending to searching out the evil in the context. Therefore, it means punishing because of the iniquity. But here, punishment is placed not upon the fathers, but upon who? Upon the children. The same word for visit here in verse in chapter 13, verse 19. But in this sense, it's about punishment. And fathers, in the case of this being just excluding mothers, the new revised uh, standard version, which is kind of like some of the new stuff they've been doing with NIV and others, it says punishing, here's how it translates, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents. Just, just say it. All right, love you. To the third and fourth generation is also punishment that is extended to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. The New Jerusalem Bible translates that, that in that language to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. Of those who hate me, uh, going back to the father uh, in the uh, CEV, the contemporary English version, that clause is there and it says, if you reject me, I will punish. And I want to share with you one that's out of uh, one out of the Holy Land as well, which is a translator's Old Testament. It reflects on the Hebrew more accurately, perhaps. I think it may say it the best. I bring the consequences of sin on those who hate me upon their sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons. And obviously that would be, uh, it would cross both sexes as well. Now, that's the bad news. Enough bad news. I, I believe that there are people in all of our families where we have had people that didn't live for the Lord. And there have been things that entered into our generation because of this very thing of a generational curse. Now, God's a God that treats you as an individual, doesn't he? Everybody has a chance to break out of these things. And I want to tell you, I know that I broke a generational curse in my own family. When I came to Jesus Christ, met him, he forgave me and changed the course of my life. And I got some good news for you as well. Now, in the passage, he says, if you look at verse 5 and 6, he says, but showing love, who did he curse? The ones that hate him, the ones that reject God, and their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren can pay for that. Listen to this, but showing love to a thousand generations. Look at the, look at the showering of God's blessings on generations to come of those who serve him. There's many reasons to live for God, and one of the reasons you should live for God is you will directly affect the generations and your family that follow you. You can't get around this. Look at what else he says. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's the camp you need to be in. That's the camp he promises. It's so interesting. He uses that incredible love word from the Hebrew language, chesed. And he says that there will be literally ongoing generations to a thousand generations of my chesed going towards them of, their, of love and blessings. It is that word we translate love, but chesed's used more for for 
covenant love. Just like an old covenant and a new covenant, the New Testament. To a thousand of those who love me, literally to thousands, to thousands that are lovers of me, I love them and will bless them. If you look at chapter 20, verse 6, the Revised Standard Version says, thousands of lovers of me, has thousands of generations of those who love me. This is what he's talking about. Generational curses and generational blessings is a very real thing. And you watch it lived out in how people are repeating patterns of what they saw before and they don't let the Lord change their life. Let me leave you with three benefits of worshiping God and God only. Number one, I wrap up with this. It will delight me. It will, you'll find fulfillment. It will delight me. Psalm 37 verse 4, what does it say? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. It's like that passage in John chapter 15 where the Lord says that if you'll abide in him and his word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it will be given to you. It's not God has given you carte blanche. Your life so aligns with God's heart that he can bless you and give to you in incredible ways. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts me will never be put to shame. Romans chapter 10 verse 11, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Number two, it will deliver me freedom. Passage in John, John 8, 36. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will do what? It will set you free. It will set you free. Set free from what? Set free from the approval of others. Instead of trying to please 30 people, you can live for an audience of one. And those that are the right kind of people will be pleased if you live for an audience of one. Amen. Also, you can be set free from your past. Be forgiven. Be empowered to break bad habits and all the rest and have a future with God. Not afraid of dying. Number three, it would develop me. Another reason to live for the Lord. Fruitfulness. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Listen to this. We're being transformed into the likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. God, living for the Lord, will change you. As we know that the Bible tells us, therefore, if you're in Christ you're a new creation. The old has what? Gone and the new has come. I share all this to ask you these questions. What do you or whom do you idolize? What or whom do you worship? Because they're one and the same. God wants you to worship him and him only. And I ask you today, would you do just that? Give yourself fully to him. Now listen. I know when I preach on generational sin, God will make me preach a message because you're going to be going, I want to hear, I want to hear more about that. So I, that's probably coming down the road, all right, because we touched on this today and I just got to touch on it. If you're here today and you need to make a decision for Christ, do so before you leave this place. If you need to have a cleansing, a purifying of your heart, there's some things that are rivaling God in your life. How do you know? That's what you give your time to. That's what you give your energy and your love to. All the things that we've talked about, if there's something that is literally an idol in your life, it manifests itself by being a priority in your life. God should be your chief priority. Amen? And you know the only way we can come to know him is through Jesus Christ.